You've got a friend in me. You've got a friend in me. It's up to you. You're 32. Going live with the depression chamber on Twitch right now. Link tweet. Perfect. What's up, chill pull cat? Chill pull cat. If that is your real name. You all disgust me. You've got a friend in sheep. You've got a friend in sheep. You've got a friend in sheep. That's right. You've got a friend in sheep. What's up, everybody? What's up, fam? Oh, oh, testing one, two, three. Good morning. Boy, it's been a while since we streamed. Do we remember how? Do we remember the basics of the game? The real question is, is it Kino? Good question. That is a good question. Mm, there we go. How many emails have you read? None. We just started. Shredder the man, you are the man. Let's see if we can get some music going. Archangel of Life. You think Disney has gone too far with the Disney live action remake? Notre Dame, yeah. We didn't start the fire. That's right, we didn't. You can't prove otherwise. I don't need to tell you where I was this morning. I didn't start that fire. Depression chamber music. There we go. Oh, tragic. Tragedy has fallen upon us all. Oh, the sorrow and pain. Do, 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 do. Don Bracken didn't start the fire. No, Don Bracken was, if I recall, home with her mother the night of the fire, folks. She found out about it the next morning, turning on the TV, that Don Bracken. Having sex with that truck? I don't know what that means. <laughs> I heard someone was listening to Asperger raps in Notre Dame. Oh, his, was his, <laughs> his mixtape was Fire Animated Demon. Is that the fucking joke? Let's get fucking depressed. Hell yeah, the Chris. <laughs> what the fuck are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Can you guys hear me over the music? Or was he just concerned about the sanity of my speech? Not the... It's not that he couldn't hear it. It's that he couldn't understand. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'd rather read people's depression stories than some guy yiffing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, folks? Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Depression Chamber, fan favorite show here on the Twitch. It's a show where people submit their stories about dealing with depression, suicidal thoughts, uh, broken relationships, all those fun things people like to vent through me to all of you anonymously. Except for when they want to put in the real names of their friends, which happens from time to time. 
which happens from time to time. Today is Depression Chamber Monday, folks. The saddest of the days. I'm going to be honest. Of all the days that end in Y, I think that Monday is the saddest, folks. That's just... It's my personal opinion. I know it's not going to be popular. Putting it out there. Garfield, famous cat, also famously, did not like Mondays either. He's a cat. He doesn't even have a job. I don't even have a job. Why do we dislike Mondays? Because they make us sad. That's why we do the Depression Chamber, to make the saddest day even more sad, folks. That's right. In a, in a cruel, cruel twist of fate, folks. We didn't do this show last Monday because, ironically, I was too sad to do it. <laughs> The Monday Blues, they came a-rollin', baby! Rock and roll! Those Monday Blues. But that's okay, we're back today. Sunday's the most depressing. Maybe if you live in Notre Dame! No, I think they're, they're six hours ahead of us. That would have all happened today. Never mind. No, I, no you're probably right. <sighs> Somebody asked what song it is, and somebody said it's a Cruel Angel's Thesis. <laughs> is, that, is that what I just saw? <laughs> no, yeah, you're not wrong. Okay. Let's get started, folks. Let's get started, folks. The less talking I do of my own volition, and the more I just read what other people wrote, the less chances that we will get banned. <laughs> the less I'm in control of the words I'm saying, the, the better quality of show. The better everything. Okay. <laughs> Let's just move on to what a Turtle Boy has to say. <laughs> His name's Turtle Boy. Uh, no, no giggles today. April Fool's Day, we had lots of giggles on this show. No giggles today. This is the Ides of April. <laughs> is it? Yeah, it's the Ides of April, folks. Serious day. <laughs> it's a serious day. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> Dear Mumkey. I just want to try this, please don't judge me. Some might not make sense, I'm sorry, it's just I've ran out of options and I'm getting so lonely most nights because most of my friends don't talk to me much. 2018 was horrible so. Uh, so fucking horrible. I try so hard to uh, not to fall back into old habits, but I have s had such a bad year, I just want to disappear. I hate 2018, it was truly horrible. It started to lose connections with friends, ending up with only two school friends. I started failing classes, and my depression started to really hit really bad again. The last time it hit me like that was a while ago in fourth grade. It was bad. I was becoming something I didn't want to be. I started panicking. Nightmares came more frequent. I stopped listening to slash watching a lot of people I used to love because of the effects of those nightmares. I was so scared. I couldn't tell anyone. I didn't want to seem insane. I was then diagnosed with depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia. But there's much more than that, really? Diagnosed with all of them. Hmm. I was then sent away for a while to a mental hospital. But there was a time where everyone there could suggest two songs to play as part of what we called Rec Therapy, parentheses, Recreational Therapy. I remember choosing the song Still Breathing by Green Day. It helped me a lot. It saved me while I was there. I remember laying awake in the uncomfortable beds, humming some Green Day songs. Well, this is, this is confirmation to me that this story is authentic and real. Because if it was a meme troll story, they could have chosen a much cringier band than Green Day for uh, the band that saved them from the mental institution. <laughs> I walk this lonely road. <laughs> That's right, Soap too. <laughs> the only road that I have ever known. Don't know where it goes. Anyway. It might seem stupid, but they are the only reason I survived that place. Then I got out. Everything seemed fine for a while, bit. Everything seemed fine for a little bit. My bad. But my absence from school was unexcused. I missed almost six weeks out of school. 
in a six month time frame. I got in a fight with my parents and sister, everyone in the house. I was being told it was all my fault my grades were falling. I was hit really hard by my sister. I got mad at her and chased her into the bathroom and then I proceeded to kick a small hole in the door. That night I fell asleep crying listening to music. I believed everything was my fault. I started to think I shouldn't even be here. I was feeling so suicidal I couldn't tell anyone. I felt like I would cause more problems. There was this one guy that was being awful to a friend of mine. He wouldn't stop. He broke me. He broke me and another friend of mine. We were so broken by him. We would do what he said. My friend was told to buy pet collars and wear them to send horrible pictures. Looking back at it now, my friend had the worst of it all. While all I had to do was draw some blood for this motherfucker. After seven weeks of playing with us, he was done with us. We were nothing to him. I don't talk to that other friend anymore, and I still have scars. It took a while to recover. But one night, I broke down. No one was home, and all I did was scream and cry. None of my friends were there for me. I hated life. Summer comes around, and I thought it would be okay. But it's not. My stupid dad lost his job, so he had to get a new one. And then he had to work from 3 in the afternoon to midnight. But as time went by, I started to get mad at the littlest things. I got mad at this guy, Alex. I'm still mad at him. I don't understand why. I used horrible ways to calm down, like hitting the walls violently. Sex. I even tried to get a hold of drugs. Ooh, heaven forbid. And, and then July comes around. A lot of stuff happened. That night when my parents weren't home and my sister was across the house, I blared random music and I went looking for, well, anything. I then found a pack of cigarettes. I've done them before, so it wasn't anything new, but I took them, found a lighter, smoked three, and hid the rest. I didn't sleep for four days, and I also managed to twist my ankle. A week or two after the stuff happened, it almost happened again, but everything had calmed down a bit. But I haven't seen my therapist in months, and I stopped taking my meds because of some of the side effects. I've also been struggling with not eating, but I have not told anyone. But everything was okay for like a week, and then it all went downhill again. On the 26th of my... On the 26th of my dog jumped on me while I was sleeping, and it... And it... Okay. Uh, while I was sleeping, and it my face... I imagine that was supposed to be bit my face, scratching it. It bled a lot, leaving a small scar, and I hate it. One night, I heard my mom and dad were talking, and my dad was saying he doesn't know if we will be able to afford the house. And then I was confused and then upset. After that, I just didn't sleep at all. Uh, but all I was able to do was listen to music, Green Day in particular, who has helped me during a lot during rough times. They have also helped me uh, so much and has been there for me ever since I was six or seven. I've honestly grown up listening to them. They have saved me more than once when I was breaking. I know I will never be able to actually thank them, so I just show them by listening to their music and standing by them. At So I just show them by listening to their music and standing by them as them grow. But I know they won't be able to save me forever. None of my friends really message me back anymore. I just feel hated by all of them. God, I'm such an idiot, pouring out my feeling to someone who probably thinks I'm just a stupid fucking joke. This life is a fucking joke. I've just been feeling so horrible recently and I'm really scared to talk to someone. I'm sorry I'm being so fucking annoying. I feel like I can't talk to any of my friends because they all have a way to contact at least one person in my family and I don't want to talk to my friends about it because they all just think I'm making a fucking joke when I talk about wanting to die. I just... I'm sorry this was a mistake. I can't even sleep anymore. Nightmares keep coming back and they won't stop. I don't want to talk to certain people because I don't want to get sent back. More shit has been happening in the last few months. I got in an argument with school kids, and now them and their friends keep harassing me. I barely have anyone to talk to, and I just want to die. Sorry for sounding like a cuck.
Okay. Well. Uh, <laughs> thank you for subscribing. I'll, uh, I'll catch up on all that stuff in a bit. We've got... Uh, we've got one called Depressed Black Girl. Do you guys want to hear Depressed Black Girl next? Yeah, that was an excerpt from the Triflers, yeah. Mario Quintanilla is not so good at English. No, everybody says no. They don't want to hear it from a depressed black girl. Can girls even be depressed, folks? Has the depression chamber revealed a genuine female depression encounter? To them, it's like Bigfoot. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, everybody has a picture of Bigfoot. i never seen them. See, these women, they... It's, it's like a, a conspiracy theory to them, this, this depression thing. Mr. Jones, thank you. Now let's find out. Okay, I've, I've already, uh, my eyes went to the bottom and I saw the phrase Tyler Perry movie. So <laughs> I'm going into this one full well knowing <laughs> this will probably not pass the the monkey Bechdel test. The monkey Bechdel test is the test that says no genuine woman will ever have depression on this show. <laughs> That's the monkey Bechdel test. Look it up, people. Let's go. Keep name private. This is school email. Well, there you go. That's uh, I guess that's proof of authenticity. I love you. Oh, too far. Fake. Your videos, I remember first watching your Survivor Guided and Elliot Roger. What? Does nobody speak English today? <laughs> and Elliot Roger videos before YouTube fucked you in the ass. For as long as I can remember, I have been depressed. But I think it started in elementary school. I was bullied heavily and called a lesbian and ugly by most of my classmates. When I was eight, my brother was sent to jail in an unfair trial. Was and was let out because the police officer was found creating false evidence on multiple cases, and he was one of them. When he was released, he terrorized my family for nearly four years before he was diagnosed with bipolar schizophrenia. I saw him hit my mother multiple times, and this scared me a lot. He also beat the shit out of my sister, so she left the house, and I was left there with my mother and medically insane brother during my middle school years. Everything got worse. I got bullied even more and was obsessed with my face and trying to look attractive. Throughout middle school, I was called ugly constantly and felt I was the only one without a boyfriend. One of my close friends said he liked me and wanted to be my boyfriend, but I didn't want anyone to know I was his girlfriend. Oh, but didn't want anyone to... Okay, I see. Uh, I agreed because this was my only chance at human interaction or even having a relationship. He felt me up five times and kissed me within the span of two weeks, then broke up with me because people were finding out he was dating me and didn't want people to know... He was dating a ugly girl. I'm not religious, but I remember crying and praying every night that I would grow up to be pretty. In high school, I thought things were uh, started looking up. I finally found a boyfriend, but he was emotional and verbally abusive. This really fucked me up a lot. I still have PTSD from it and can't take people yelling at me. The stuff he would say and put into my head made me commit suicide with sleeping pills, but it did not work. The relationship lasted for two years, and luckily I was able to leave him when he changed schools. He stalked me for a year after coming to my house or wait or bus stop waiting for me, asking me to take him back, or he just wants to be friends. He still tries to message me to this day, asking, asking to be friends or meet up with me. If you want, I can send screenshots. I still have them. In the 11th grade, God finally answered my prayers and made me attractive. Fuck you! <laughs> Fuck this! <laughs> nope, does not pass the monkey Bechdel test. <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> the chat's on my side here. <laughs> Bullshit, stop reading. <laughs> Easy, God delivered. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty now. <laughs> Great. 
In the 11th, I want to read it with a wacky voice now. Fuck you. In the 11th grade, God finally. <laughs> Is that disrespectful? I want to read it like the book Monkey Monkey. In the 11th grade, God finally answered my prayers and made me attractive. <laughs> you guys want the whole thing read like that? <laughs> And coming from a person who was ugly and is not attractive, I can say people who are more attractive treat ugly people like shit. <laughs> Read it as Vincent, okay. I gotta get into character. <laughs> That's not real! <laughs> That's not even fucking real, you stupid Christian. <laughs> Okay. When I was ugly, no one wanted to engage in a conversation with me. People did not want to sit or be around me because I was weird or looked mean. People treat you with more respect and are extremely more polite to you when you are attractive. <laughs> I thought this would help with my depression, but it just made it worse. Oof. Oof. Man. Goddamn. You know, I feel like that was a tad disrespectful. I, there's so much empathy in my heart for beautiful girls <laughs> oh man I can't imagine I truly can't imagine anyway anyway let's keep reading goddamn fem cells ugly girls you can you can send in stuff if your if your confidence level is so high as a woman <laughs> That you would classify yourself as attractive. You got no motherfucking place on the depression chamber. What are you thinking? Come on. You think these are the people who are going to relate to this shit? A Monkey Jones fan will relate to the struggle of being a pretty girl? Are you fucking kidding me? I'm getting heated, folks. I'm getting fucking heated over here. Uh, okay. Ah, uh, where did we leave out? Okay. I thought that if I was attractive and like by more people, I would be happy, but it didn't do shit. In the 12th grade, my mom started to develop schizophrenia and lost her job because she thought they were out to ruin her life. Soon we lost our house and I had to start living with my friend for the rest of the school year. My mom is going into a downward spiral and is dragging us down with her. We are currently living in her friend's house because my friend was accepted into a universe university and I had to leave town. I am attending community college and want to kill myself. I think that's a statement that has been said many, many times <laughs> throughout the course of human history. I am attending community college and want to kill myself. I feel I have no purpose in life and feel everything is going to shit. I feel I have everything I want and still feel like shit, and now my family is homeless. I don't have enough money to, su to support myself and get myself to school and work, so I have to keep living here. Oh yeah, and my dad is a crackhead. My life is basically like a Tyler Perry movie. This story isn't fake, I promise, lol. Anyways, I just need an outlet to say what I'm feeling, so I hope this wasn't too long. Okay. That's weird. She, um, she signed the email with one name, but then the email was sent from a different name, but it's the email of her school. So it's, so which one, why would you have a different name down here? Maybe she has one name as an ugly girl. And then when she got hot in 11th grade, she got the new name. <laughs> <laughs> and the the ugly version wrote the email, I guess. She's like Jekyll and Hyde, but the ugly part and the, and the hot part, they come out at night. At least she has a dad. Oof. I should still be reading it in the Vincent voice? Well. Hey, let's see if I can... If people are sending in bits and we're not hearing an annoying sound effect, something is very wrong. Something is remiss, I would even say. I'd go that far. Let's see if that fixes it. Uh, 
Uh, we have a donation from Maria saying, last donation I'll send until I find a way to sort everything out. But thanks for having so much content to get me through this dark time in my life. Yeah, Maria, I've, uh, I've seen your, your struggle on that Twitter video. Fan of the show, Maria, kicked out of her own home. Very, very graphic footage of who I assume is her father hitting her. Nothing anybody should ever see. Asterios Kokonos retweeted it, and I said, Asterios, please, please, I, I, I understand the struggle, but I don't want to see it so fucking brutal. Horrible. I hope you get to a safe place, Maria. Lafaza, thank you for subscribing. Let's go to the next one. Now, this one is from a guy named Juan Stamos. Sounds familiar, right? And it's called uh, My Story of Being a Trans Fortnite Gamer Girl. I think that might be a fake one, folks. I don't know. Do you, does, that sound, uh, does that sound like a real story? <laughs> Let's see. It says, uh, so here's the thing. I bleeping hate Trump. That wasn't me bleeping. It's written in the email. He embarrasses me on my YouTube channel. Okay. I think it might be fake. I, don't, I think that one's fake. Read it as Mike the Southerner, yeah. No, I, I feel like that one is a, not a real story. Let's see if we can find a real one. No, that one seems fake. <laughs> the real uh, depression is uh, me trying to, <laughs> to find a real story. Uh, okay, here's one that says, Humanity, all of my suffering on this world has been at the hands of humanity, particularly women. Okay, why do, why do I feel like I have that email memorized? Okay, another fake one. <laughs> I think uh, I think people were having some fun on April Fool's Day. Uh, okay, this one this one seems familiar, but we'll read it. I hate when people send in the same story multiple times because I don't remember if I've read it. But let's give it a shot. Okay, here's one from a guy calling himself Dog. Hey, Mumkey, I have a story I think will be very entertaining to read for the Depression Chamber. I saw the two Depression Chamber stories on your channel. I watched the streams, and I think my story over the past seven months would fit right in. I'll use anonymous names. Before I start the story, I should give you some context. I'm an 11th grader in high school, and for the past five years, yes, since I was in sixth grade, I've been in an Instagram DM group with about 10 online friends. We used to only really talk about sports ball and other stupid shit like that, but now we talk about our lives and send memes, so yeah, it's pretty autistic. That group chat will come into play later, but back to the story. I switched into, I switched into chemistry on the second day of school, and there's this girl named Abigail, not her real name, but I'll use it for privacy purposes. Should have gone with Ashley. Nice, classic, A, fake girl name, Ashley. At first, I didn't really have a crush on her, but around October, I started to. All right. All right, let's do a little game uh, of, of the, the depression prediction, folks. Let's all predict in the chat where we think the story will go. I have not read this. I think, based on the, the information given so far, he will invite this girl who he has a crush on, into the Instagram group, try to hit on her all the time, really cringy shit, and then she'll go off and fuck one of his friends who is also in that group. And ultimately, his jealousy will overtake his soul, and it will lead to him being banished from the group entirely, and he'll be left heartbroken with no friends, nobody to meme with. That's the monkey prediction. Mumkey, do you know from experience? Well, let's just say uh, maybe I maybe I send in this email myself. <laughs> Who could say? You predict his penis falls off? Whoa! Yeah, that's probably more likely. It's going to be a cuck story. Well, let's see. Let's see if this uh, is actually me. Uh, where we go? Uh, I, I started to have a crush on her. Uh, she's this really pretty Latina. Sounds like me. Sounds like me. Not the Latina part, but the... <laughs> you, you probably get it. She's really nice and innocent! Whoa! That rare duo of, of traits on a woman. Nice 
and innocent. Very rare. The first couple months of school, we had a few interactions and she, <laughs> interactions, and she was nice to me. And I guess we were on good terms. But I developed a crush on her. She was always pre positive and confident, and she was so pretty. She was just such a wholesome person, and I began to love her. Hey, whatever happened to... If you describe the most beautiful girl you've ever seen, you have to submit a photo! So we can all ogle! This is bullshit. Although I barely knew her, I just had this perfect image in my head of her. I tried to find her Instagram, and I couldn't. I told the people in the group chat about her. There was this one kid in the group chat, let's just name him Steven. Steven's penis who has been pretty much a master doxer slash troll for years. Don't fuck with that guy. Oof. He'll hack your shit. He somehow found her Instagram, and I played it off like it wasn't her, and he believed me. For about a month, nothing really happened except my obsession for her kept growing. I think it's worth noting that I lost 50 pounds since March of 2018, and I was a decent-looking guy. But I had, and still have, everything I'm saying about my condition still applies to me today. Body dysmorphia. In pictures I looked fine, and everyone told me I was normal or skinny, but I still thought I was fat. It fluctuated. Sometimes I thought I was an ugly, fat fuck, and sometimes I thought... I did write this, didn't I? Uh, sometimes I thought I looked great. I heard in the podcast that you have body dysmorphia too, so maybe you can relate. I obsess over my looks when in reality nobody gives a shit, so I have really low confidence. I think it's also worth noting at this time I dressed like a mix of Season 2 Jesse Pinkman and Vincent the Atheist, so that didn't do me any favors. So anyway, back to the story. It was after Thanksgiving break and I had the genius idea to admit uh, t to the DM the girl Steven found was the Abigail I had a crush on. I also decided to add her! <laughs> I also decided to add her! I didn't expect her to see the DM, but later that night she did. I started panicking and hyperventilating, and I couldn't even look, so Stephen and Abigail started talking to each other. Abigail wasn't a mean person. She was just creeped out. She was added to this random ass group chat. To Steven's credit, he didn't tell her anything about me and she left. It's also worth noting I used an anonymous Instagram account. It wasn't my personal account or anything. So I thought I was in the clear, but I had sent a picture of me in the DM a few hours earlier as a meme or some shit and she saw it. So the next day at school, she confronted me about it. She was like, Chandler, okay, funny name. Chandler, you have some explaining to do. But she didn't have a serious face or anything. It was amusing to her. I made some excuse about how I was in that group chat and they kept telling me to add someone from my school and they randomly found her account and made me add her. She just chuckled and said and was like, Chandler, you should leave that chat. Those guys are mean. Again, she was really nice and a genuine good person. Steven added her back to the DM the next week, and she never came in, and I just assumed she declined the DM or something. Fast forward about a month, nothing really happened. My obsession with her kept growing. At this point, it was winter break. If you think the story is complicated now, hold on to your hat, because this is when it really starts to get hectic. I was stalking her Instagram, and she had her Snapchat in her bio. I got Steven and this other kid in the group chat, Marcus, to Snapchat her. I have no idea why. I guess because I was too scared to snap her myself. But they did, and they actually had decent conversations with her. Again, she's actually a really nice person when you don't be autistic. About an hour later, I felt bad and added her on Snapchat to say, Sorry for adding you to the DM and for all this harassment. She said, It's okay. A normal person would have stopped there, but I had to send a shitty image of a cute bear holding up an I'm sorry picture. <sighs> she said, It's okay. 
a weird, awkward loser, but not a complete fucking retard would have stopped there. But I just had to send her... <laughs> oh. Ah! <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, would have stopped there. But I just had to send her a lowly shit post holding up a sign. I'm sorry. She left me on red. <laughs> Mission failed. <laughs> we'll get him next time. <laughs> okay. Uh, a couple days later, I sent her this stupid video of Zek Strumsky. If you don't know who he is, you've probably seen him on a meme page or something. He's this really ugly autistic kid. Just search him up if you're that curious, you'll recognize him. Singing, girl, you're so fly to me, for some reason. I have no idea why I did any of this stuff. She left me on red, so when I woke up the next morning, I used the sorry my friend sent that excuse <laughs> and said the people in the DM said they'd give me a $25 PSN card if I sent that. She said, um, no, and finally blocked me. <laughs> Steven actually kept in contact with her and messaged her how is your day smiley face and things like that But she was obviously uninterested fast forward a couple weeks We were back from winter break and I decided to make a new snapchat to message her a long apology It was pretty long and when she saw it. I guess she accidentally closed out <laughs> I don't know about accidentally <laughs> <laughs> if you have Snapchat, you know how chats delete once the person sees them and doesn't save them. So she said, sorry, I didn't read that. Can you send it again? <laughs> it's like 10 paragraphs. <laughs> At this point, I was just so annoyed. Uh, I sent her a picture of a hot dog with cum on it. <laughs> And I said, get pranked, bitch! <laughs> what? <laughs> oh no, my brother Patchy <laughs> sent me a picture of the bear. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, bear. Oh god, you can't see it. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Patchy is sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I sent her a picture of a hot dog with cum on it, and I said get pranked, bitch, or something autistic like that. Then I said, seriously, Chandler is sorry, <laughs> from the third person, and she blocked me. Then about a week later, Steven messaged her like he often does, and at first things were normal. Then she got pissed and said, you're a fake bitch. She's like a devout Christian, so she doesn't curse, so obviously she was pissed. Steven was confused. Keep in mind, he always sent their conversations to the DM. Turns out she was in the DMs and we couldn't see her <laughs> because she didn't accept or decline the DM, so she could just look at them. <laughs> That's why whenever I'm invited to a group chat on Instagram, I never accept or decline. I'm spying on a hole, you motherfucker. Is every single person on Instagram in some sort of group chat with Barack Obama? Because I've been invited to like 30, and Obama's in all of them. <laughs> There's no way he can use his DMs. It's fucking full. <laughs> Obama needs friends. I don't think Obama made the groups. <laughs> He's the one who made them all, hoping that people would talk to him. Okay. Um, we couldn't see her because she didn't accept or decline the DM so she could just look at them. She said to Steven on Snapchat, Chandler, I hope you're reading this. I hate you. And, hey, Steven, you gonna visit Chandler in the hospital? And she said, Chandler, you want my bad side. You're gonna see it. God help me now. Or something like that. 
She let her, she literally said she was going to snipe me and her uncle was in the military and taught her to never miss a shot. Then she started talking shit in the actual DM to me. I was too shocked to be scared, but then I got scared because I realized she could probably beat my ass since I'm some skinny loser and she's athletic and on the cross country team. So later that night, I apologized because I was scared. <laughs> there was some long fake apology, but she bought it. I forgot to mention earlier that this other F slur in the DM group named Jackson added Abigail's best friend Jen to the DM about a month before this stuff. Jen started talking, and as of 4 to 19, she's still in the DM. She talks sometimes, and I have no idea why she hasn't left. So yeah, it's been a couple months later, and I guess Abigail and I are on decent terms. We sometimes talk in chemistry, it's like this whole thing never happened. But she sits with some ugly nerd that joined the class like a couple weeks ago, and they have... They seem to have built a friendship, and that honestly brings out my inner Elliot. I should be the one talking to her, but instead it's that F slur. Anyway, besides that, I guess I'm over her. Abigail is actually a great person, and I wish we could have been a thing. She's a senior, and in two months I'll probably never see her again. I doubt anything else will happen, so yeah. Thanks for reading this story, Monkey. I've been watching your videos for like two years. Maybe that's why I'm so autistic. Hopefully that story made some sense. I know it's complicated. If that made no sense, sorry. Good luck on your streaming career and your YouTube career. Here's how mistakes are made, folks. If you are a high school male and you self-define as... As, as you define yourself as somebody who watches Monkey Jones, all your friends are in a fucking DM sharing memes, and you say that you're not athletic, and in fact, you're a weak, wimpy bitch. If those three things you can self-identify as, you have no motherfucking business crushing on a senior Girl who is sexy and athletic and Latina to boot? What are you fucking thinking? Out of your league, stop it! It's only gonna lead to autistic endeavors. Just realize she's not for you. <laughs> not for you. Absolutely not. And, and, and trying to interact with her will exclusively lead to this shit. Stop it. You people need the, the fucking self-awareness. Self-awareness would prevent 95% of the bad things in these stories from happening. Anyway. What? Okay, uh, I assume this one is fake, but it's, it's pretty short, so we'll read it. Uh, <laughs> John Smith, I assume it's his real name, he says, Believe it or not, I am not autistic. In fact, I'm nearly the opposite, if that is in your comprehension. In other news, I relapsed into watching MLP this year. MLP stands for My Little Pony, which I am ashamed of knowing the abbreviation for. When I was 12, my friend's deviant of a sister seduced me into watching MLP. After facing ramifications at school, mass bullying slash curb stomping, I dropped the show for good. Or so I thought. In my senior year of high school, I had long forgotten about MLP. This all changed when I saw the Is It Kino episode on the My Little Pony movie. Uh oh, <laughs> I caused yet another relapse, folks! It's all I ever do is cause these relapses. I help the stereos relapse back into soberism. Uh, among others. After extraordinary boredom overcame me, I had just gotten my wisdom teeth pulled out, I watched the season two finale. I really liked it. And now I have a shitload of fun watching MLP with my friends while drunk. I regret nothing. Love you, monkey. It's not really a depression story, is it? <laughs> hmm. Okay. 
we've got an email from a company called Autism Parenting Magazine that says, thank you for your order. <laughs> oh, I didn't order anything. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh my god. Okay. <laughs> okay, we've got one that is a few pages long. It's going to take a while. And it's from somebody claiming to be a 16-year-old girl, folks. Could it be yet another fine opportunity to conduct the monkey Beck doll test? Can a girl truly be depressed, folks? We're about to find out. We're about to find out. All systems go. Engage. Activating the flute of depression. Oh, systems go, baby. Oh! Tonight on SmackDown. <laughs> She's trans calling it now. You're fucking right, Lofaza. I bet you're fucking right. Tay is Tay. Thank you for the Twitch Prime sub. You know, let's roll up our the sleeves of our fucking jacket for this one, folks. It's about to get spicy. About to get spicy. Hey, Mumkey. I am a 16-year-old girl, a sophomore in high school. I watch these Depression Chamber videos the same day they are posted. I love them and I wish to share my story. Hopefully it isn't too long. When I was young, my family was quite happy. My dad worked hard to provide us with what we needed. He works as a body man, which is very hard work. This woman sounds Asian. She's Chinese is my prediction. My mother had hepatitis C. Very, very many Asian women get hepatitis C, it's true. From all the times she shot up drugs as a kid, my mother's condition plummeted and she was bedridden and couldn't get out of the house. She gained so much weight and was in chronic pain. Throughout my early childhood, I was my mom's condition get worse and she eventually died. Dying, 100% of Asian women die. I still think this might be a Chinese girl. She died right next to my father in the middle of the night. In the morning, my father awkwardly told us she had died of a heart attack. By this time, I was six and had no idea what was happening. I don't have much memory of my mom. My memories I have are us doing arts and crafts in our big nature-filled backyard in the country. Her walking to the shower and her bedridden, and then her, the last memory, her being carried out of the house in a bag. Before she died, we all went to Disneyland together, and it was probably the greatest thing I will never be able to remember. I am jealous of my two older sisters because they have more memories. I also have this feeling of wishing I would have never been born so I couldn't have caused her to die sooner because she had the stress of the pregnancy and the stress of having another kid. When I was young, I found a letter of her saying how she felt so guilty for leaving us. In elementary school, I didn't have any friends, and it became natural to be an outcast and to keep space between me and other people. My, f my father grew to be crazy. My dad turned to the bottle, at night slumping around the house and falling down. My sister finding him passed out naked in the bathroom. Every Saturday was cleaning day at my house. That day was filled with yelling and fighting. My sisters and I were crazy, and my dad was a broken man. We were all broken. 100% of Asians feel guilty. <laughs> True. Uh, I finally got friends at the end of fourth grade, and it was amazing because we all lived close together, and they, made, they always made me happy. It was a nice couple years of peace and childish joy, well mixed in with the crazy fucking family, but still. In sixth grade, I moved from a very small town of rural to a bigger town with a big-ass middle school. It was about the size of a community college. I was too shy to be myself or make good conversation with all the kid around me, so I spent my time alone. I was so scared to be at that huge school. There were too many people. I literally screamed and cried for my dad to put me in homeschooling repeatedly. He wanted me to socialize with kids. 
I wanted to show him that I could still socialize, so as any newly turned 12 year old, I turned to the internet. Eventually, I met Maria Monier. She was a self-proclaimed artist and wanted me to be her model. She had a whole website dedicated to her art and she offered me to me what I thought was a lot of money, $90 for me to model for her. I was excited, I never had so much money. Uh, so we video chatted and eventually she coerced me into taking off my clothes and doing illicit acts for her. Eventually the chat stopped and I just couldn't help but cry, but uh, I didn't even know why. I just couldn't make the tears stop. The next day she tried to get me to video chat her again, but my sister and I were just about to go for a walk, so I said no. But she said she would pay me if I refused. E uh, she, I'm guessing, wouldn't pay me if I refused. Even so, I refused her demands. Maria stopped talking to me. After this, I found myself having angry outbursts at school and being so fucking depressed. One day, there were some guys trying to find out who I liked, and I told them to fuck off, and they all crowded around me and yelled, Fish at me, which was a slang for bitch. Seventh grade rolled around, and my friend, let's call her Nay, started to scratch herself as a way of self-harm. She openly admitted she d did it mostly for attention. Yeah, no shit. In November of that school year, my dad and I got into a fight, and I retreated into my room. I looked around the room and found a sharp safety pin and scratched at my stomach. In return, I got this feeling of relief. In that moment, I found it that it was so easy to escape the emotional torment if I just hurt myself. Every day I would cut. I can't remember 7th grade. I know that once again because I was so emotionally vulnerable and hurting that I fell into another online child pornography scam. I honestly didn't know that what was happening to me was wrong and was something that shouldn't be done. In these times when I was used for CP, I literally felt nothing or thought nothing. But afterwards, I would be so emotional. The second time, I had nightmares and panic attacks all night. That's when I learned what a panic attack felt like and then continued to have them throughout my life. Then again, I had the unrelenting tears that wouldn't go away. I beat myself up constantly at the time, calling myself a whore and telling myself how worthless I was and how I deserved to die. I had been suicidal ever since I was 12 and I comp contemplated it very often. The pain I felt from these events is something I will never be able to explain, but let's just say I was in deep agony and felt intense worthlessness. Additionally, I still cut myself every day at this time. By 8th grade, I had friends and I actually hung out with them at lunch. Some of them moved away, so it was just me and Nay and this girl, Dee, who was a major lesbian. Dee was from a messed up home and she told me how her mom's boyfriend molested her. Nay was my best friend at the time and all of our conversations were about her. Eventually, when I could, I told her the vague details of my abuse how they manipulated into it. I asked Nay if she thought it was my fault because I honestly wanted to hear that it wasn't because all I was hearing was that it was my fault and it made me feel like a stupid whore who should go kill her worthless ass. Nay responded with, I mean, yeah, it's your fault. This made me feel so fucking horrible. I wanted to fucking die. I went off and told Dee about this and she told me to go and talked to Nay, and so I did. Nay apologized. I told her how, about how I often feel like how the abuse is happening again, and I flash back to it and freak out like a toddler. Nay responds with, yeah, I have anxiety, like when I am out and I have to talk to people. She goes on to talk about all her problems. Nay doesn't fucking get it. Having social anxiety is not the same thing as to what I am going through. I stopped hanging out with Nay, and I asked Dee why she was still hanging out with her since she was so rude towards me, but she stuck with Nay regardless. Eventually, some of my other friends were talking shit about Dee, and I don't remember why, but I told them all about how her mom's boyfriend molested her. I outed her as a victim, and that caused one of our friends to go tell the teacher about her victimization. I felt bad because I didn't let Dee 
uh, out herself, but I wouldn't do anything different because it turned out to be positive. Dee told me how she felt more free from coming out and then eventually reported it to the police. During the winter break in eighth grade, I started to have tactile hallucinations where you think someone or something is touching you, but it's not real. These hallucinations consisted of choking and rape. It was so scary, and I hate thinking about it because I don't want to trigger it or remember the helplessness. Whenever these hallucinations happen, no matter if I run around, they eventually catch up. The only thing that made them go away at the time was cutting myself till they went away. It is also worth mentioning that in middle school, I started hearing a voice that was convincing me to fall in love with a boy. When I say voice, I literally mean voice, like someone talking to me that was not me. This voice also told me that I was a whore and shit too. Eventually, it got to the point to where I felt that this boy was reading my mind 24-7 and was spying on me and talking about me. It was fucking weird. Eventually, all these feeling slowly went away, but the voice was still there. I told my sister that I hear voices, and she went off and told my father about it. My dad talked to me alone, then took me to a doctor where they diagnosed me with major, depression, uh, major depressive disorder at 13. In the doctor's office, I openly told her about my plans for suicide in front of my dad, which I could imagine now was heartbreaking. When my dad left the room, the doctor asked me if I had ever been abused, which was awkward because I had to lie the whole time. In my times in middle school, I befriended a girl one year younger than me named Wendy. Wendy came from a broken home, and eventually we started hanging out after school. I really love Wendy. She is fat and adorable. She will play a big part later in the story. Emphasis on big, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> In 8th grade, I also joined a musical for all the schools in the district. The director was a performer in live musicals from Disney. He was awesome. My favorite teacher, he really believed in us, telling us we are actually worth something. I had a ton of friends in the musical. I felt like a popular kid. I was the oldest in the musical. Everyone was younger, but there were people close to my age to hang with. It was just an awesome time, and I felt like I belonged there. We practiced the musical for about seven months until we performed. They wanted to teach us how to be performers, so that's why it went for so long. We performed it amazingly. During this whole thing, I learned about a charter school, and it sounded nice. After what seemed like forever, and to my surprise, I graduated middle school alive. Yay? For high school, I transferred to the charter school my friend from the musical had told me about, which was only like two miles away from my house. I was determined to make friends, so I did. After five or so months, I settled into the school okay, and since the school was so close to me, I rode my bike to it every day. During the winter break, through the tactile hallucinations, I uh, started again, and everything sucked. During my math class, my friend told my other friend in our group about a support group her dad is the leader at, which she has to go to. The person she was talking to didn't like the idea, but I did. So I got the details about it, uh, where it was and what time, and I started to go. My first time I went, my friend was not there, so I was there all alone. I popped into the room asking if I was in the right place, and this once wise guy told me that I was at a mountain climbing club. It was a joke. This wise guy turned out to be my friend's dad. This support group schedule is as follows. Potluck, Christian songs, this is a Christian program, a lesson on the 12 steps, and then group where we talk about our lives. After I sat down at an empty table, a bunch of old ladies came to shake my hand. Another new girl came through the door and sat at my table. Eventually, potluck ends and the songs turn on. The new, the new girl next to me starts to cry, and of all things, a man comes up to her and com com uh, comforts her. Seeing men act decent is weird to me. In group, I learned that it's okay and normal to cry in group because the new girl was crying and people weren't freaked out. I kept going to group despite how weird all their Christian talk was. I was agnostic at the time. 
Despite me as well keeping my mouth shut in group, I kept going. One day as I was riding my bike home from school, I turned to the bike lane. I got hit by a pickup truck. After skidding and my head bouncing like a ball on the ground, thank Jesus I was wearing a dorky ass helmet, fuck fashion, I got up right away, picking up my damaged bike, asking the men if they can take me home. They insisted that they call the police. I didn't want them to because I thought I was fine. Eventually, the police got there and so did the firemen after like 10 minutes, even though the fire station was not even a block away from us. The police interviewed me and despite my best efforts, I cried right in front of everyone there. I really tried that time too. Eventually, the first responders in the ambulance, overkill but I get it, asked me to roll up my sleeve to get my blood pressure or something. They saw all the scars on my arm. Eventually, I learned that I had a broken thumb, which became more obvious because of all the swelling, and I called my dad to come and get me. My dad got there. <clears throat> my dad got there, and they told my dad that they thought I was trying to kill myself because they didn't buy that I was airheaded enough to ride my bike into oncoming traffic. Spoiler alert, it was just a blonde moment. Anyways, I went to my doctor's office and waited almost three hours to get treatment for my broken thumb. Eventually, they laid me on the bed and held me down as they stuck a giant needle to my bone. It was the most intense pain I have ever felt. Yelped as they stabbed me deeply. After the medicine kicked in, they pulled my bone back into place. Let's segue. At this time, me and Wendy were seeing each other often and were growing closely together. I kept going to the support group. I started cutting myself deeper. I smoked weed whenever I could with my sister Kayla. I stole hydrocodone opium from my dad so I could get high. At the same time, I became a Christian and entered a public speaking contest. I gotta, oh, gotta throw that fedora right back off my head. My speech for the contest is why drugs and alcohol is bad. <laughs> okay, that was their grammar, not mine. When I gave the speech, people from the support group came to support me, and at the end I came in second place, winning $300. The people from the support group, which is called Celebrate Recovery, or CR for short, these people gave me flowers and hugs. Also by this time, I got a sponsor from the 12-step program. Layla, my sister, soon confessed to my father that she was raped when her good friend let their friend take her home. He took her seven block away from our house and raped her in her car. I felt so much anger towards her attacker. I talked about it a group, and without my permission, my eye started, uh, decided to start crying, and my throat started to constrict. The women really felt for me, though, and comforted me. For the, su for the summer, I signed up for taking college classes during the summer. Okay. I signed up for biology. I passed biology, and this made me extremely proud and joyful. Like it turns out, I am not as retarded as I tell, uh, as I, yeah, as I tell myself. I was having uh, my own blonde moment reading that sentence. I signed up for more college classes for the fall semester and eventually spring semester. At this time, me and Wendy are super close, and we loved each other. But I am always the one texting first, always. Sometime in September, Wendy's aunts started going to celebrate recover with me. I recognized them from a family gathering I went to with Wendy. In late uh, in late bleh, late in October, I start going to Bible study with her aunts and some other CR people, all women. Bible study was led by our pastor. I also started going to church at this point, carpooling with my sponsor and Wendy's aunts. I hope this is all building up to one uh, soul-crushing moment. Because <laughs> otherwise, why are we reading all this shit? We have to trust that the story goes somewhere. I thought about Maria ooh, uh, Monier literally every day, reminding myself about it, hurting myself over it, and crying. I checked out her social media. Wait, is who the fuck? Is this a person I would recognize? Maria Monier? Let's take a look. If I can type in the dark. Maria. No, not Mario. Monier? Who the fuck is this bitch? Hmm. I'm not seeing anything. Weird that you'd be including their full name as if they were real. <laughs> yeah, no, maybe it was Mario, you're right. 
I checked out her social medias again as I have done a thousand times. This time something clicked in my mind. One of the comments was uh, this woman asking to see Maria's art in quotations that she would love to see it. I realized she was circulating the child porn. I felt hopeless. There was always a feeling of maybe it is out there and a sinking paranoia. Now it was confirmed. I felt my life fall apart. A few days later, I went to Bible study again uh, at night, feeling super suicidal. I wanted someone to care and see me. Nothing. Always nothing. There was nothing inside of me but the constant and only feeling of needing to die. After Bible study, Wendy's aunts dropped me off. At the time, I didn't have any razor blades, only small shaving blades. So I went to the bathroom and hopped in the tub. I used the razor to dig into my skin. Blood started to puddle and trail down my thighs. I stopped momentarily to watch the blood. Then I started to get scared as I saw the blood pump out of the wound to the rhythm of my heartbeat. So I decided to stop. I just sat there for a few minutes, taking in the high I got from this wound. Yeah. When I got up and cleaned up the wound, I saw that I had four missed calls from my sponsor. I called her back, mentioning nothing of what I had just done to myself. Since I was a minor and I didn't want my sponsor running to my dad and tell him about my abuse, I told her my dad knew. Thus, this had begun the tribulations of this lie that acts like a cage on my life. I also waited a long time to tell my sponsor the abuse happened online because I felt pathetic and that it wasn't bad enough to feel upset about. Eventually, I let her know it was online, and to my surprise, she didn't dismiss me as pathetic and to go away. The last time I saw Wendy was before my suicide attempt. She ranted about feeling super suicidal, and I expressed how I love her. I tried to say all the right things to make her feel better. Uh, eventually, Thanksgiving break rolled around, and it was chaotic around the house. Like I always had done, I pulled out my razor blade and hopped in the bathtub and cut myself till the water was red. I can't read that shit. The water was filled with hair, dirt, and blood. In this abdominal soup, I started to pass out in it, having to shake myself awake every 10 seconds so I wouldn't pass out. Then I came to reality. What if someone had to find me like this, soaked in blood and wounds covering my thighs? They wouldn't be able to get the image of this out of their head. It also started to occur to me at that day that God loves me as well, which made me feel better. Oh, great. This is, this is the uh, I became hot in 11th grade of the story. Oh, God. I have God. I can't tip my fedora hard enough. Skumpkey, thank you for gifting subs today. Anyway. I thought to myself, if God can love all these horrible people, then he will have no problem loving me. I hope you stop being religious by the end of this story so you can be truly sad. Like us. God damn it. No pun intended. Uh, during Thanksgiving break, I went to CR and was dropped off by Wendy's aunts. They told me they were going to the hospital to get some drugs for one of them. They are always sick, so it seemed legit. Later, my sponsor told me that she is praying for Wendy and hopes she recovers soon. I asked her what was happening. It turns out that Wendy had tried to kill herself. I literally fell to my knees crying. I called up Wendy's aunts, 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 who were at the hospital seeing Wendy. They picked up when I got to talk to Wendy. I cried to her, telling her never to do something like that again and that I love her. I really wanted to tell her, how dare you do that to yourself? Don't you know I love you? but had to try, uh, thanks water, uh, to try and control my emotions. I stayed on the phone for two hours until eventually I had to go. The next day, my amazing sponsor took me and I let my sister Layla tag along. We picked up flowers, stuffed animal, a card, and a sugary drink from Starbucks to Wendy. I skipped school to stay with Wendy till she was sent off to the mental hospital. Layla ran off halfway through seeing Wendy to go smoke weed, which was okay because I wanted one-on-one. -on -one. My sponsor picked me up and I watched movies at her house. I was stuck in a state of shock. 
My eyes peeled back further than normal in the blank stare I held along with the feeling of what the fuck. While with my sponsor, I got a call from my dad. I told him the mental hospital Wendy was going to. He replied, oh yeah, your mom went there. Red flag alert. Eventually, I went home the next day and got into a screaming match with my dad, and I ran out of the house to the park near me. I walked to the creek that runs next to the park. I stared at it and cried profusely. I walked into the creek, embracing the icy temperatures of the winter water, just wishing for death to come upon me. I walked back home, tears falling down. I came home to Layla. I started a fight with her when she tried to talk to me. She stopped me and tried to talk to me, asking why I am upset and what is wrong. Obviously, my friend just tried to kill herself. Layla, whenever I talked to her about my being used for CP, blamed me. She had said things like 12-year-olds can, con can consent. In this interaction, she got me to talk about the CP. I told her she doesn't understand, but I didn't finish my sentence. She said, I had a dick shoved in my vagina, I understand. No, you don't understand, because the CP of me is being spread. She tried to tell me it wasn't being spread, but I know the truth. She confronted me. I cried in her arms. So many subs from Skumpy. Thank you. I told her about my suspi suspicious... I'm guessing suspicions? About Mom and how I had a theory about how she didn't actually die of a heart attack. She actually killed herself. She told me I was correct. She told me she found out by reading her death certificate and that dad told her not to tell anyone. She told a story about on the night of her suicide, my sisters were folding laundry and my eldest sister was being rude to mom and Layla smiled along. It got bad and my, mo my mother cried in the arms of my father, telling him how she can't go on and do this anymore. All of this happening as my sisters are laughing at her. Layla told me I was a good girl and I wasn't cruel to my mother. I was just a little girl. I know I need to stop crying, but I can't stop it. I called my sponsor and told her about it. Soon my dad came home and was super pissed about how I yelled at him earlier. It was really bad. I called my sponsor and she said I could spend the night with her. My sponsor took, uh, my sponsor took, had to go grocery shopping. So we stopped at an outlet. The store lights and music invaded my senses and swirled me into a hardcore panic attack. I stepped outside. Then I got a private call. It was Wendy. I was so happy. It was just pure ecstasy when she called me from that mental hospital. A few weeks later, my dad confirmed that my mom actually killed herself and she had several attempts before she died. Time to skip winter break. Wendy is out of the hospital. At this time, I had been seeing a counselor since November and a sponsor since, since about May-ish. They all think my family know about the CP. I started to formulate a plan to tell my dad about it on the way to CR after New Year's. I call up Wendy to tell her about my plan. She is so freaking happy. There are two times I saw her in winter break. It is all fuzzy, but I remember that she went to church with me and I told her about my suicide attempt. Her literal and only response was, okay. Anyways, so when I call her, we make plans to have a sleepover on that day, New Year's Eve. We had fun that night hanging out and making each other laugh. We also made plans to give each other tattoos, which was something we talked about a lot. The next day, we, brought a we bought appropriate ink and met up with Wendy's boyfriend and hung out. I third-wheeled pretty hard that day. We went home and prepared to do the tattoos in my room. As we were attempting to do them, the ink spilled all over the carpet. We hurried to clean it. My dad is very materialistic, so this would make him furious. In a hurry, I grabbed bleach to clean it. We used all the paper towels in the house to try to clean it up. Wendy was all depressed and ranting about her shitty life, which is something she does all the time. I didn't need it right then. She talks about how she has too many people who love her, and she wish wishes they would all just go away. I have the opposite problem, and it was annoying me that all, of all moments, she's using this one to rant. This is not your problem, Wendy. I am not insulting her or being rude. I am just annoyed, so I'm acting cold and just saying people love you, Wendy, and I don't know, shit like that, I guess. I can't remember. It was just too stressful. 
Who's going crazy with the fucking subs tonight? Is that still Scum King? The story's almost over, don't worry, folks. Eventually, Wendy stops helping me and sits back and texts her BF, which annoys me. I am so fucking depressed at this point and dead inside. I grab a razor and chug some NyQuil and walk to the park in the dark. I walk, recounting all the shitty things I've done, recounting my worthlessness and my retardation, how I should have never been born. As I am walking to the park, I get a text from Wendy's boyfriend. Maybe you should stop being so rude to Wendy. Confirmed I am a shit person. I can't even love right. Again, there was tears shed. Stop, please. I sit at a bench, pull out my razor. Even though finding out about my mom's suicide and Wendy's attempt I didn't cut, but the steel uh, gilded against my skin and red ink poured from my arm to the bench to the floor. I watched the blood fall. I called Wendy and asked about the text. She told me she didn't mean it and didn't ask him to do that. Self-harm fulfilled every emotional void in my life, except love. Drugs didn't do it for me, not even heroin. Self-harm wasn't just an addiction, it was my life. I liked collecting scars at the time, but now I look at them and I wish they would leave me. Self-harm was relief, and in my own way, I was express expressing the pain in my heart. The NyQuil is kicking in and I am tired and bleeding. I could feel the cold wrap itself around me. I walk home in the freezing winter, bleeding all over the jacket I wear all the time. I come home just in time to hear my dad calling for me, so he did not burst in my room looking for me. I sit on my I clean my wound and sit on my bed. I talk to Wendy while covering my wound. In that moment I was wondering if I should tell her I cut myself open again and was bleeding. I eventually did, then I went to bed. I had a dream. An angel came to me in my sleep and showed me a letter with a bunch of doodles on it, telling me to write a letter to my dad of all the stuff I had went through in my life. In the morning, I had a huge fight with my sisters. I punched the wall and literally screamed. I told them to go away, but they wouldn't listen. I got every upset and I took Wendy with me to the bus stop. And on the bus, I began to write my letter to my dad about mom and the CP. Wendy and I found a refuge with her street-running pothead friends. We walked to her BF's house, and while there, Wendy and him went into a room alone, and her other friends were making out. I scrolled down Insta and remembered that I have Wendy's account logged in. I remember her texting a lot yesterday, and so I was curious. I looked on her DMs to her boyfriend, and she was talking mad shit about me. I stormed out of her boyfriend's run-down house and walked two and a half miles home before calling and ranting about Wendy to Layla and my sponsor. I called my dad to pick me up, and he took me home. Today was the day I was going to tell my dad about the CP. Wendy wasn't there to support me while I do it. There was no human to support me. I called my sponsor as well to ask if I could stay the night with her. I didn't want to face my dad after telling him. She said I could stay the night. Later, I called Wendy to talk and we made up. She said she was being a bitch and attempted to blame it on her being bipolar. I asked if she wanted to come to CR with me tonight. She said yes, but when, she, when we came to pick her up, she wasn't there and her boyfriend texted me saying she had a mental breakdown. We tried to look for her, but we couldn't find her. My dad and I arrived to CR. I handed him the letter and told him to wait till he got home to open it. I left the car with anxiety, peeled back eyes and a blank stare. During CR, my dad texting me a sweet message saying that the family is there for me and he loves me, something like that. It was so sweet. All this love, though, is uncomfortable, and I wish love didn't seem so one-sided to me. Like, love means sex, but sex is evil, so love must be evil. I swear that is word for word taken from the Elliot Roger manifesto. Um, from this, I had this intense freedom I had never had before. It was amazing. Time skipped to a few days later. Wendy becomes a runaway and I am helping her. Wendy, her guy friend, her dad and I were involved in a conflict against her dad. Wendy's guy friend wanted Wendy and her dad to have a sit down talk. I asked Wendy a thousand times if she wanted to do this. She went along with it. 
The confrontation goes bad. Wendy's dad is swinging her by her wrist, trying to take her pep away her pepper spray because he thinks she's going to kill herself with it. Wendy runs off and I chase after her. Her guy friend confronts her dad alone. Wendy talks about suicide with me. I try my best to say all the right things. At the end of the night, she is at my house. I call up my sponsor and ask if Wendy can stay with her for a while. She agrees. Later, Wendy's dad allows her to stay somewhere else for now. My sponsor and her husband talk to Wendy and I am there. Eventually, Wendy starts talking about how a family friend raped her. This was new news to me. It made me so upset that I didn't know this. She knew all about me. I get it. Why she wouldn't want to talk about it. But I thought we were closer than that. I go to the bathroom and in my sponsor's bathroom where she stores a ton of matches. So I start lighting matches and putting them out on my skin so I can stop crying and be strong for Wendy. Eventually, one of the nice ladies at CR takes Wendy in. This makes me happy. She has opportunity now and a stable home. She isn't starving and having to steal pads and food to survive. She can get new clothes, take a shower, and get perfume. I have to admit, this girl smells. At this point, I am thinking about talking to the police about the CP, so I plan to talk to my pastor about it. I didn't know if this was one of those things you can... Uh, you turn the cheek on or not? I don't know what that... Oh, okay. Uh, on the day I'm supposed to see my pastor, I find out Wendy is running away from her new home. She wants to run the streets and be a hood rat. So I am riding to the meeting with my pastor, super scared and shaky, and at the same time trying to convince Wendy to go back. It is actually good. All of it happened at once. I needed a distraction from the meeting. At the end of it all, Wendy didn't go back. I did everything I could to help Wendy, and she just discards all of it. Hashtag relatable. I talked to my pastor. I didn't even have to say the words. I couldn't say the words. He knew what happened to me. He comforted me. It's not your fault. You're the victim. All those nice things. He told me that if you can stop bad things from happening to other people, try to stop it. I have never met a man so kind and smart. I never thought any man would say that to me. Weren't they all just rapists? Mm, cute. I love this man, platonically of course. From that talk I knew what I had to do. My therapist and I called up the police and reported it. Since there are a lot of sex crimes in my town, they haven't got back to me since the day I reported it. But I have a case number and I am in a head officer's caseload. Wendy is not here in my town anymore. She got sent away to live in the city with her dad's girlfriend. I am done with her shit. I need a break from her. Wendy has threatened to kill herself countless times, threatened to get into strange men's something of which she has done before. Uh, strange men's, and then there's no explanation of what. And ran away into the night, scaring everyone who cares about her. Not to mention, she doesn't even care enough to trust me first. She says she loves and cares about me, but then treats me badly. In the early February, I got baptized and became anew. The day I got baptized was also the day my beloved pastor was leaving the church and moving across the U.S. I told him he was the reason I went to the police. I thanked him for being an amazing teacher. He told me he was glad he met me. That comment made my whole year. My life isn't perfect, and I am still depressed sometimes. My body is covered in scars as well. I haven't cut for a long time, though. My life has got way better from joining a support group. I have a new family with CR. I don't think about the past as much now. I also thank Jesus for being my strength and friend. Anyways, I hope someone can relate to my story. I hope that this story isn't trash, LMFAO. Even if you don't read it, I feel better putting it all together. Hopefully it was understandable, and I know I made spelling errors, so sorry about those. Love you, Mumkey. Finally. Lots of... Tentacle monsters in the chat today. That's a long one, folks. The longest I think we've had from a girl so far. The question is, does it pass the Mumkey Beckdoll test? Is this evidence that a genuine female 
can suffer from depression. Give me, give me your, uh, give me your votes in the chat. Give me a, give me a yay or a nay. Is this evidence that women can feel depression? Yeah, no, too Christian. I agree. I agree. If you, uh, if you seriously believe inside your brain that you have eternal salvation, say it with me, folks, eternal salvation, eternal salvation, folks. If you honestly believe in that shit, you will, that you will exist for infinity amount of time in paradise. Again, hard to empathize. Oh, what are these earthly troubles that have, that have <laughs> fallen upon me? Oh, oh no. Oh, these, these 60 years of misery in exchange for eternal happiness, folks. Whatever. Whatever. See, us, de us depressed people who don't believe in that shit, this is all we got. We don't think, oh man, it sure does suck now, but at least one day I'll have eternal paradise. <laughs> this is our eternity. <laughs> it's this hellhole you call an earth. Tip fedora, tip fedora, tip fedora. I need to, why, why do the donations, <laughs> the text is always so small. It's like the size of my penis on screen, folks. What's going on? Eternal salvation. Say it with me, folks. Embarrassing. Eternal salvation. Eternal salvation, folks. Okay. Donator message settings. Font size 32. <laughs> what are you doing at 12? Why do you keep resetting between streams? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a good thing we didn't have the sound effect for our subscriptions turned on, because I think we got about 50 of them over the course of that story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dry's man in the chat. He spelled out eternal salvation. Thank you. Finally, somebody gets me. Somebody gets... Okay, that donation was, Can I submit a depression chamber story in the form of rhyming couplets? Yes, you can, Lofaza. We love poetry. Depressing poetry is the only poetry that should exist. I think that the flower, flowery, flower, flowerly, flowery, the f that flowery poetry bullshit, disgusting. Love, love sonnets, disgusting. If your poem don't make me want to cut my fucking throat, why does it exist? Fuck poetry. Lowest, lowest form of art, lowest form of literature, poetry. Especially free form poetry. Okay. Uh, you just wanted to write down your fucking thoughts and not worry about rhyming or uh, tetrameter or any of that shit. Fucking free form poetry is not fucking art. You're just writing random shit, pretending it's deep. Oh, oh, it doesn't have to have meaning. The reader will do the work for me, folks. They'll solve metaphors that don't exist because I just wrote random shit in my free form freshman level fucking poetry 101 class in high school, folks. I'm a deep artist. Fucking disgusting. Free form poetry is the equivalent of dabbing randomly. <laughs> the soap chewer says my thoughts are sad and that is bad. That is, that is poetry. That is poetry. Why do you have Vlad the Impaler on your shirt? That's like having Hitler on your shirt. Well, the, my Hitler shirt was in the wash. <laughs> I had to go for the next best thing. I wonder if Chris Angel has written any poetry. Uh, I'm the mind freak. Isn't that how the theme song goes? I've watched every episode of that show. I should have the, the theme song. Mind freak, mind freak. I'm the mind freak. Anyway, these are all E-Rich replacement applications, so let's uh, let's find the next depression submission. E-Bitch, 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 E-Bitch. Okay, here's, here's a short one. Here's one from Rotten Cherry Pie. I am a bad person. I am a terrible excuse for a human being. I am a waste of space. I don't deserve the simple pleasures in life like food, water, or sleep. 
I'm absolutely pathetic. I'm a short-tempered, self-sabotaging attention whore. Did, did you write this just so you could hear me say <laughs> these things? <laughs> you fucking asshole. <laughs> Nobody likes me. My family, yeah, I think I did write this. My family hate me and don't want me. I have no in real life friends. He's just listing shit that I've said before. <laughs> Dickhead. I have no real life friends. I have deleted all my social medias because they were too stressful and addictive. I only conversed with random strangers anyway, so I'm alone. I feel like I will never be happy. My life will never get better. I will always mess up and be useless. I don't know what to do. My mother is mad at me for cutting my body. It's my only good or working coping mechanism. I have a retarded and fragmented sense of self and identity. I don't know who I am or what I want. I'm pathetic. Just pathetic. Pro tip, your life will improve significantly once you delete your Facebook. I tend to agree. My life did improve significantly <laughs> when I deleted my, my personal Facebook account. It's true. What? Uh, okay. Here's a here's a kind of short one from Jesse. Could be any Jesse. There, there's a lot of Jessies in the monkey lore. I imagine this could be any of them. We're not gonna say which one. It could be any of them. Hey, monkey. My name is Jesse. I have a good life, but it's been better, and I've been diagnosed with anxiety disorder recently. So that's been weighing on me as well. I was a streamer on Twitch in 2017 to 2018 before being banned for showing lowly pornography on stream via donation link. <laughs> it was around 3 p.m. and I was quite dazed, so I made a joke about Digibro and didn't close the tab like the fucking moron I am. Ever since, I stopped making money online and was forced to go outside and get a real boy job, so I applied to a Chick-fil-A. I was later brought in for a short interview, which was exciting, and I was sure I'd get the wage cut job, then be done with it. Unfortunately, near the end of the interview, the urban fucking dictionary definition of my alias was pulled up for some reason. Not the lowlies, not my racist or anti-Semitic jokes, not my ass pictures, but my urban dictionary definition. To this day, I don't know how they managed to get that and nothing worse. The definition that was brought up went as follows. Jesse, aka God, is an Australian streamer who got banned from Twitch on 7-15-18. He was banned for lowly hentai pornography, which appeared when he clicked on a donation link at like 2 in the morning like a fucking moron. Jesse now spends his days saying he's going to make a podcast and living in a dumpster. Quote, Jesse, did you hear Jesse, aka God, is going to make a podcast? four-year-old. Please let me go. I don't want to go into the trash can with you again. This definition is quite accurate and funny. However, it ruined my chances at the Chick-fil-A job. I'm afraid I'll not be able to get a job if I could even get a shitty fast food gig. The dumpster I'm currently in is quite cold nowadays, and if I don't get another internet career off the ground, I'll be forced to molest little girls covered in trash for the rest of my life. Thanks for reading my sob story, if you ever do. Anybody know this uh, Jesse, a.k.a. God guy? Anybody watch his streams? I guess we can't see... Uh, maybe we'll find him on Social Blade. We can see what he was like before he got banned. Jesse, a.k.a. God. Search on Twitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we require a minimum of five followers to get entered into our database. Well, <laughs> okay. At least he has a sense of humor about it. Yeah. Yeah, what else can you do? Oh my god, this story's fucking longer than any other. Oh. All right. All right, I want to make these shows two hours long, and this one will probably put us over two hours, but that's okay. We'll read it. We'll read it. We like these big, long stories. Yeah, we'll read it. We'll read it. Don't do it, says Patchy's GF. 
No, it's it's uh it's not as long as the the other long one we read tonight, but it it's pretty dense. Okay. Here's one from Sonic. All right, I'm just gonna cut right to the point. This all started back in the summer before my freshman year of high school. For time reference, I'm currently a senior in college with a semester away from graduation, so this would be summer of 2011. I made friends over time with people of similar interests to mine, video games, anime, and the like, and thanks to a streamer we all watched who was a moderator on, an, on another bigger channel on Justin.tv, which eventually became Twitch.tv. He was a small streamer, so the chat was not super active, so having a flowing conversation was more than easy. We really only talked when, uh, whenever this guy would stream, so eventually we wised up and moved to a group on Skype. It was a big group of friends doing calls of up to 10 people that would last far into the night. In particular was my affection for this one girl. Keep in mind in this group there were about four girls who were actually active. And for the sake of privacy, we'll refer to her as Nova. Now yes, Nova was the typical hashtag gamer girl next door that every guy had a crush on. However, I thought the relationship I had with her was far deeper than the others. I was the first person out of that group to make friends with her. We would talk into the late hours in the morning one-on-one -on -one with her on Skype. Keep in mind, I live on the east coast of the U.S. and she was on the west coast, so it was more of a problem for me than it was for her. We would often play video games together and be co-hosts on each other's streams when either of us would stream. It was no one's surprise that I would eventually develop a crush on her. And let me tell you, that shit ran deep! It got to a point where I would spend most of my free time thinking about her, not like that, you sick fucks in the chat. What assumption is he making about the fine folks? The fine folks like bacon crafted curtain in my chat. And why would he why would he assume that they would have dirty minds, folks? When I told my closer friends from that group, obviously in separate chats from the larger Skype chat, about how I wanted to confess to her, it took some time and a lot of encouragement from them for me to even work up the nerve to send the message to Nova telling her I had a crush on her, mainly because I was, and still to this day am, a coward when it comes to stuff like this, but we'll get to that later. A while after my freshman year started is when I confessed to her. She got the message and basically gave me a let me think about it message. Okay, that wasn't a no. There was a gray area where it could come out to us being in a committed relationship. The next immediate day, I got the message that I feel shaped the way I am today. The first word in the message was, I'm sorry. My heart sunk to my stomach after reading that, and I couldn't muster up the nerve to read the whole thing. But I skimmed it and got the gist. She wasn't interested in me like that, and only thought of me as a friend. At the time, I thought of this as whatever, no big deal, and moved on. Our relationship was relatively unchanged. Or so I thought. Interestingly enough, it was after this where Nova stopped appearing in the group as often, showing up maybe once per month. Now, she said that this was because she took on a lot of extracurricular work at both, uh, at, during both our high school careers. I had no reason not to believe her, seeing as we lived on opposite sides of the country, and it's not like I could fucking go stalk her or do some other weird shit. In the end, it was good that she went away like that, as it gave me time to clear my head. Skip to around the beginning of my sophomore year, with my IRL friends met from my only mutual friend from middle school. And we are still friends to this day, but again, more on that later. Both me and him were hanging out in a pavilion in the park near our high school after class ended, waiting to be picked up by our parents. I was sitting down near our group when out of nowhere, this girl just comes up to me and sits in my fucking lap. I have no idea who this girl even is, let alone her name. For note, I never actually asked her herself what her name was. I just overheard people call her by that name and I just rolled the dice and called her that on the assumption that it was her name. Thankfully, I was right. The fact remains that this lap sitting thing was the first memory and I had of this girl, and for the sake of privacy, let's call her Nathalie. That's a weird fake name, and Nathalie? Why not Natalie? Is her real name Natalie, and you faked it with Nathalie? What is this, NordVPN? You're not hiding shit! 
Now, we spent that year basically getting to know each other and essentially play-acting like we were each other's boyfriend and girlfriend without actually talking to each other, holding hands wherever we went together, and me kissing her hands, face, and neck with her never saying that she didn't want me to do that. In fact, we got so close that both our friends basically referred to each other as each other's lover. Now, keep in mind, I did eventually grow actual feeling towards her, to no one's surprise, but I still had feelings for Nova during this time, during whatever time I was able to spend with her. For that matter, I was able to get her actual phone number. Everyone in the chat was exchanging phone numbers, to be fair, so I just took the opportunity. We didn't text back and forth like we used to as often, but we did speak more often because of this. It was a classic situation of, who do I choose? <laughs> Clearly, you don't choose the girl who already rejected you! <laughs> I had someone that, even though she rejected me once before, I had it in my mind that maybe her, maybe her knowing that I liked her, combined with the fact that she didn't date anyone during high school because she was too busy for that, made me think that these were subtle hints that she might have similar feelings. Compared to someone that I knew in real life, obviously she did like me back in hindsight, but I knew her for a lot less. So the question was, who should I have picked? Obviously the one you knew in real life and that liked you back, you fucking dipshit moron. I'm glad he said it. <laughs> a bacon-crafted curtain! You don't need to say it! He already said it for you! Mumkey, you dumbass. Nathalie's a real name. Fuck bullshit. Maybe 0.000001% of women are named Nathalie. If you're gonna come up with a fake name, say goddamn Mary Sue or Jane or some shit. Nathalie. Ah, oh, no, it looks like it was a typo, because now it says Natalie down here. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Nathalie's not a fucking real name, it was a typo! Anyway. Skip ahead to somewhere. Around the middle of junior year of high school, I noticed that Natalie grew somewhat distant towards me. She was very unwilling to even talk with me, let alone going around places holding hands or doing that other lovey-dovey shit we did in the previous year. I took this as a sign that I should confess to Nova <laughs> again. This time took a lot more to coerce me to do so, and it took a lot of pushing from mutual friends of ours. Buddy, let me tell you this. This is Nova's biggest fear in life that you will confess to her again. <laughs> Don't do it. It's, she's like, okay, okay. He confessed to me, it was awkward. I'll slowly start talking to him again. Maybe we can get, oh, he's gonna ask me out again. Great. Fucking marvelous. Perfect. Nobody wants that. Just take the no. Just take the loss. There's, there's at this point, four billion other women on this planet. <laughs> Get rejected by at least a billion of them before you go back to Nova. Come on! You reject me once, it's your loss! Respect yourself, it's their loss! It's like Shark Tank. Oh, you didn't, you didn't like my offer? Well, I'm out, motherfucker! No money from me. Anyway. Uh, that time was now. I worked up the nerves. She was online and active. The moment was perfect. I told her that I still had feelings for her, and I said it outright. I want to be your boyfriend. Suffice to say, history repeated and got hit harder than the first time. She wrote a long-winded message that she just didn't see me like that, and actually apologized to me that she didn't see me the same way I saw her. All I could say was thank you for being quick and messaging me back, and that was the last I saw of her for a long time. In fact, I learned from a, from a mutual friend of ours that she felt like she lost a friend that day. So on some level, I feel like she was just as hurt as I was by that happening. Fun fact, to this day I'm still friends with a general group of friends who pushed me to confess to her in the first place. Uh, one of them also being a Monkey Jones fan, so if you're listening to this, buddy, trust me, you helped me more than you hurt me. So, what about Natalie, you might be asking? Around finals time at our school junior year, I was hanging out at quad-type area in the middle of the school, sitting at a picnic desk where our group of friends usually hangs out. Normally, I'm the first to get this, and this time, Natalie got there a while after I did. We there... 
just shooting the shit with each other, having a good time. Now it was just me and her, both alone, so the thought crossed my mind that I should confess my feelings towards her. And I did, only to receive what felt like a punch to the gut. That she had a girlfriend! I have no idea how I remained composed and even had a smile on my face during the whole ordeal, but I did, despite the fact that I felt like I was burning up inside, and even still feel a little bit like I, as I was typing this out. I just went back to my laptop that I had with me and just faked typing on the keyboard and looked normal as more people came to the table that day. Let's skip ahead to senior year. I talked to Nova less and less. The Skype groups eventually moved to Discord, and I saw Nova in them less and less as time went on. As for Natalie, we kept a somewhat normal relationship with each other. We just didn't talk as much, nor did we do that lovey-dovey shit as often as we did it my sophomore year. Plus, I knew at some point she broke up with that girl she was dating, or at least it was an assumption that turned out to be correct. Jump to about the end of senior year where I was about to graduate. I had it in my mind that... I was a now-or-never kind of situation, uh, as I still had feelings for her and still thought she might have generated feelings for me over time because, again, with the lovey-dovey shit. She never said she didn't want to do that, and she never explicitly said no to that. Regardless, I couldn't tell her to her face that I still had feelings for her, mostly out of fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. So I wrote a confession note and had a mutual friend of ours deliver it to her, as I couldn't even bring myself to do that. I left my phone number asking her that if she wanted to talk about this with me over the weekend, she could do that. Well, the weekend passed and no text. On Monday, I was uh, I with my own group of friends crossed paths with her and her friend group. Eventually, she calls me out and pulls me aside, telling me... She got my note and said she couldn't text me because her phone wasn't working. In short, she said she didn't want to do she didn't want to date long distance because she had a bad experience with that before. I quickly note that I'm not going away for college. I wanted to do I wanted to, but that's another depression chamber worthy story. She then basically said she just sees me as a friend and doesn't want to date me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so much for that first excuse, huh? I took that in stride, hugged it out, and quickly went on to my next class. I went on to graduate, and we ended up going to the same community college. And in the time I was there for my associate's degree, I only saw her twice in the span of two years. I do still think about her, even to this day. However, I don't want to contact her or try to reach out to her, because I know that all I will see her as is a romantic interest rather than a friend. I think she knows this as well, which is why she never reached out to me in the time since high school. I did have some crush-like interest during that time, though. There was one girl in this class I was taking uh, for when my degree track was education, who I thought was pretty cute. We were able to hold conversations with one another well and got to work on projects for the class together a lot of the time. Unfortunately... I never bothered asking for her number on the last day of class, like the thought in the back of my head told me to do so. I don't know whether or not I would say that is my greatest regret, but it is certainly up there. Now the time is in spring semester of 2018. I was in my new college after I transferred schools from getting my associate's degree. I changed degree tracks into political science before I transferred and in this semester was taking a class on the politics of Congress. For this class, we had to do a group presentation slash debate on a particular issue. Long story short, I caught feelings for this one girl who was on the opposing side. After our presentation, I caught up her and basically pushed praise on her for her part of the presentation. We then got to talking and shooting the shit, and I on the spot asked her if she wanted to have lunch with me and talk more. But she said no because she had to study for a math test, so I just walked with her to the library and dropped her off there basically. We talked about each other, our interests, and our work. However, as time went on, I noticed that my mind took an interesting direction from when it comes to my emotions. To put it simply, I started to show general nervousness when the thought of seeing her came to mind. In fact, I wouldn't even say it was nervousness, more so that I was feeling genuine fear from the thought of even being in the same room as this girl I thought I liked. Eventually, I thought to myself, 
Shouldn't I be excited to see someone that I supposedly have a crush on? I went to ask an IRL friend of mine, one of the few I kept over from high school who was currently studying psychology. In short, she basically thought that all of these previously described experiences led to some form of psychological trauma, or at the very least, strong mental associations about relationship building. I actually never ended up talking to her again as long as that class went on, mainly because I was too scared to try to talk with her. Now about a half year later, I was at work, and I work as a substitute teacher for the uh, county, by the way. And one day, so this, kids in middle school, this might be your substitute teacher writing this in. And one day when I was covering for an 8th grade English class, in comes a person around my age. Uh, don't fall in love with a girl while you're substitute teaching, man. And she introduces herself to me. Let's call her Bree. We spend the next hour talking to one another, neither of us really paying attention to the kids, and we were hitting it off very well before she had to leave for the hour. I bite the bullet and ask her for her number. She enthusiastically says yes. I get her number, and by the next weekend, I text her. She's a slow responder, but she does respond, and over time, I eventually ask her out, to which, again, is very willing to do, as I invited her to this boba tea shop near wh where I live. And she, was, and she was very interested to meet with me. Long story short, we had to reschedule at least three times, pushing back our meeting for various reasons, as I was very willing to do accommodate for her. As like any other Monkey Jones fan, I had no life, so I'm pretty flexible when it comes to scheduling. How dare you? The bacon-crafted curtain in the chat is not a loser with a lot of free time on his hands. He's a good man. He comments on podcasts, folks. <laughs> fucking bacon crafted curtain ass motherfucker. <laughs> Fuck you, fucking bacon bitch. I've heard of bacon bits, but you're a bacon bitch. Anyway, let's finish the story. Long story short, thank God. <laughs> bacon crafted curtain says, damn right. <laughs> bacon bitches rise up. Long story short, the day comes where we're supposed to meet. I even asked her the night before if she's still good to meet that, just in case, and she said she was. That morning, I was playing some Kingdom Hearts 3 to calm my nerves for what was my first real date, until I get a text from Bree saying, and, <laughs> and I quote, my boyfriend doesn't think it's a good idea for us to meet. Oof. He said oof, not me. Uh, all I said was that I understood and haven't talked to her since. <laughs> yeah, uh, Shredder, the man, you did call it. In all honesty, looking back, I'm not even really that mad about the whole situation. Why would she give her number to a guy she just met and talked with for about an hour, have extended text conversations for hours on end, sometimes rolling on into the next morning, while she was in a relationship with another guy? The situation makes no sense to me looking back on it. And really, I'm not upset at the situation. I'm more upset that I took a day off from work to meet with her only to be met with this. On top of that, my favorite teacher from high school emailed me the night before asking if I could cover for her classes that Friday. Obviously, I said no because I thought I had a date during the time school would be in session, but that wasn't the fucking case, huh? Fast forward to today, a whole year later. As I mentioned before, I'm graduating in the summer with a bachelor's degree in political science, and I'm working into getting into a graduate program that can accept me because, quite frankly, where I live has a pretty high cost of living and moving anywhere else is a bitch to do, so I need more money in the long run. In one of my on-campus classes, there's this one girl I'm trying to talk to. I only got to talk to her once, and all I got from her was her name and that she was super into Dungeons and Dragons. That was two weeks ago, and she hasn't come to class since I talked to her until today, the day I'm writing this email. Couldn't work up the nerve to talk with her again after class. Story of my fucking life at this point. This email took me three hours to compose. At least that's what it felt like. I hope you, Mumkey, enjoyed reading my sad, sad life story. I am actually going to therapy now. I told her the gist about my romantic stories above, 
but she pushed that aside to focus more on my strained relationship with my parents, which again, that's a whole other depression chamber worthy story. I hope the chat got some kind of schadenfreude, schadenfreude, how do you pronounce that? Schadenfreude? Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. Need to get Florian on that one for me. Schadenfreude! Reactions to my story, and God help your soul if your you reaction to this story was, that's literally me, unless you are me. For that matter, I look forward to when you read this email, and I look forward to yours in the chat's live reactions for certain parts of the story, especially for when my high school not girlfriend turned out to be a bisexual and dating a girl. What a fucking twist, huh? Anyway, good looking out, monkey. Take care, and with you, the best. With you, the best. Thank you, Sonic. Thanks for the story, Sonic. All right. Was this guy in the chat? Did he did he reveal himself in the chat? Maybe he's not here yet. Maybe he'll watch the VOD. The VOD! The video on demand, folks! All right. I think that's going to be our last story of the night. We're pushing up on two hours. Folks, sorry. Again, I'm so sorry that I didn't stream this last week. It was not a good week for me. <laughs> but we're back. We're back on track. I want to get a serious Twitch schedule figured out, like, guaranteed, four nights a week, same time, same place, every Monday doing Depression Chamber, various other things on the other days. Really want to bunker down, get serious about this shit. Um, working on my next big video. Should be up on my Patreon probably by the end of this week. It's going to be about 25 minutes long, and it's part one of a four-part series. So look forward to uh, that new video coming out relatively soon. Having fun with it. Um, it, it's, it embarrasses me far more than anything in these stories has embarrassed any of these people. It might be the most mortifying video I ever make in terms of... Uh, the the long-term repercussions of, of what people think of me, folks. Could it be cringe in its purest form, folks? The story was so fake. He said she's a gamer girl, and as everyone knows, gamer girls are a myth like unicorns, a divine existence, world peace, or Asperger's innocence. Can you thank all the new subs? Skumkey, I, I thank you for all the new subs. But honestly, I don't know how to read a list of my new subs. <laughs> but I, I appreciate it so much, Skumki. I'm sure everybody else got a kick out of it. I was busy reading stories. You think I'm a fucking monster? Fuck you, bacon crafted curtain bitch! How far back in the emails are you? Uh, this one, I think, was from uh, April 6th. So we're about a week behind. Can you tell us anything about the new video? Well, I mentioned what it's about in the most recent monkey vlog, but people don't watch that. <laughs> so I, uh, it's a, it's a trilogy, or no, it's a, it's a quadrilogy. Is that a word? It's a four-part series about <laughs> the text is so big we couldn't even read the whole message. <laughs> it's a four-part series about films that I made for short film contests over the course of my life, and uh, some of them are not pretty, folks. Not pretty. Have you ever considered growing a mustache? Absolutely not. Ten minute video revealing my teeth? Yeah, that'd be pretty embarrassing. I, I thought for about one second about getting uh, adult braces so I could finally perfect these teeth, but then I realized, <laughs> nope, not in this career field. <laughs> Having fucked up teeth is more respectable than wearing braces. Ask Chris Stuckman. I'm sure he regrets it. <laughs> that guy's never living that down. Invisalign is good. Yeah, well, maybe we'll do that then. No, no brace face. Lunchables review. I don't have a Lunchable on me. Mouthpiece. Yeah, I might get that Invisalign. But then again, I think it adds character. Fucked up teeth. They add character. Yeah, I look like a fucking demon. That's how you know me and Rusty Cage are meant to be. Fucked up teeth. Central. Wait, Chris Stuckman is a Jehovah's Witness? Are you... Is that for real? 
That is much worse than adult braces. <laughs> Beautiful monkey teeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right, folks. Here are some streams you can expect in the coming week. I think Wednesday night around 8 p.m. Eastern time, we're doing a special episode of Is It Kino? Scheduled are me, E. Rich Florian, and special Is It Kino guest, Asterios Kokonos, discussing the extended version of the uh, classic Zack Snyder film, Watchmen. I guess like the four-hour director's cut or something like that. I've never seen Watchmen before. I never read the comic. But they decided we need to do this episode before E. Rich retires. Other than that, we will be doing more uh, voicemail shows, listening to all of the voicemail applications for E. Rich's replacement on Is It Kino? Uh, it's been a while since we did that, and I've got a million of them to go through. So if you like some good <laughs> autism, you know where to tune in. And uh, I think I have a Pokemon Nuzlocke I've been doing for about a month. <laughs> I should probably bring that back. <laughs> anyway, those are uh, those are the plans for what you'll see on this uh, Twitch channel this week. Hopefully, <laughs> Stereos actually makes it to the Izakino episode. Otherwise, it won't be a very special episode at all. <laughs> It'll be just like any other. <laughs> oh yeah, twenty four hour stream. I do still owe you guys a twenty four hour stream. We'll we'll see about that. I uh, was not in the right mental place to be doing that the last couple weeks, folks. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to another rousing episode of the Depression Chamber. I hope it helped you get through some things. Probably didn't. But what are you going to do? See you next time, folks. Go subscribe on YouTube to All Hail Chancellor Susan. Don't forget it.